thanks for the introduction and thanks to the organizers too. Uh, so Howard Stein's deservedly influential paper, Yes But, some skeptical remarks on realism and anti-realism, uh, was first brought to my attention by David Mellon. I don't recall how long ago this was, but it must have been quite a few years because it was sufficiently early on in my relationship with David that I had no idea what a kindness he was showing me by taking me out to lunch and listening to all my great new ideas about theory T and evidence E and theory T prime. <laughs> years later, as the awful truth about what that conversation must have been like for him, <laughs> dawned on me. I remember forlornly telling my colleague Penelope Matty, but he seemed so genuinely interested at the time. <laughs> Uh, in the course of that conversation, David suggested I might enjoy having a look at Howard's paper, which, of course, I'm now tempted to see as a characteristically gentle suggestion about how I might want to invest my time more productively. <laughs> uh, I did read it, and I've never fully recovered from the experience. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, I'm quite sure I've read Yes But more times than any other single paper. And every time I decide to read another one of Howard's papers, a little voice in my head says, Oh, but we're so close to figuring out <laughs> all the things we didn't understand in Yes But. Uh, let's just go finish that off first. Let's just do that first. And I read it again. Uh, in fact, the best description of the paper I know comes from within the paper itself. Uh, it tells of friends of a young and impressionable Howard Stein <coughs> taking a course from Peter Hempel and encountering a pair of related fallacies which Hempel called the fallacy of nothing but and the fallacy of something more. We've already heard. We've already heard about a lot of the things I'm going to mention. But Stein next says, "My friends did not elaborate, but this terse fragment, fragment seemed intellectually nourishing, and I still snack upon it." So here's the thing: yes, but consists entirely of terse fragments upon which the author does not elaborate but which are undoubtedly extremely intellectually nourishing and well worth snacking on at any hour of the day or night. Much of my own further work on scientific realism has been concerned to engage with that paper and to fully unpack the nuggets of wisdom packed cheek to jowl on every page. I'm grateful, for Howard to write, grateful to Howard for writing it and to David for suggesting that I read it and right now seems like an unnatural opportunity to say so. So here's how I see the paper's central line of argument. Uh, although realists and, anti and instrumentalists see each other as having distinct and competing views, the sort of knowledge we get from theoretical natural science, this appearance of conflict is misleading. Yes. Again, we've heard. Right? When, inter oh, sorry. when interpreted with excessive simplicity, <coughs> to these doctrines <coughs> simply inadequate as a theory of the dialectic <coughs> scientific development. But once each of these supposedly conflicting doctrines is sophisticated in ways that are independently required in order to make them at all plausible or attractive, any substantive difference between them just evaporates. More specifically, realists must abandon any pretensions to metaphysically transcendental claims about noumenal varieties <coughs> in reference. Yes. Karim said it's within a theory, yeah. reference is a theory. Uh, and they also have to give up the idea that they can explain the success of our best scientific theories or of the methodological principles by which we arrive at them by what Stein calls hypostasizing <laughs> further characteristics of those theories and principles. This, as an explanation, this fails, he says, in just the same way that supposing greenness is somehow really in the grass itself does nothing to help explain the phenomenological character of the visual experience we have when particular nerve impulses <coughs> are directed to appropriate regions of the brain. Hypostasizing further entities or properties can only help explain the utility of our theories if they are, quote, put in relation to phenomena. And any explanation of the utility of our methodological principles is either, in the back up here, susceptible of clear formulation in terms of the relations to, of theories to phenomena, in which case the instrumentalist also has good reasons to adopt them, or they're not, in which case they contribute nothing to explaining the success of those theories and principles. For their part, instrumentalists must enrich their conception of how theories function 
as useful cognitive instruments to include not simply calculating experimental outcomes, but also adequately representing phenomena in detail across the entire scope of nature. And perhaps most importantly of all, uh, <clears throat> serving as resources for inquiry, especially as sources in, of clues in what Peirce called abduction, the search for good hypotheses. <laughs> Once the realists' ambitions have been appropriately restricted and the instrumentalists' ambitions appropriately expanded in these ways, we find that no room remains for any <clears throat> substantial difference between them. In another quotation we've seen before, Howard says, what I really believe is that between a cogent and enlightened realism and a sophisticated instrumentalism, there is no significant difference, no difference that makes a difference. He goes on to suggest that in the work of the deepest and most sophisticated scientists, his examples are Newton and Maxwell and Einstein. Uh, in the work of those scientists, important aspects of realism and instrumentalism are present together in such a way that the alleged contradiction between them vanishes. Uh, Jim Weatherall and I sometimes refer to this as the balanced humors picture. <laughs> <laughs> the deepest scientists have the right blend of realist and instrumentalist attitudes. But Stein also gives us a number of historical examples in which influential scientists have had their humors imbalanced in either a realist or an instrumentalist direction with insidious consequences for their own further investigation of nature itself. Right? Uh, he, oh, no, yeah, he tells us, for example, that Poincaré, because he regarded the ether as a fiction rather than a reality, was unwilling to take very seriously, although he was willing to play with the idea that charged particles exchange momentum with the ether. He said that's a very hard position for an instrumentalist to take, but there's no warrant at all in the instrumentalist view for grading the entities of a theory in degrees of reality or fictitiousness, regarding particles as more real than the ether. Poincaré's simplistic instrumentalism thus makes a false estimate of the scope of the theory as an instrument. Uh, by, uh, in, most importantly, neglecting the critical role that all successful theories should play as resources for inquiry and clues in the search for even better theories. Uh, by contrast, Stein picks out Huygens and Kelvin as scientists whose humors were imbalanced in a realist direction, leading the former to reject Newtonian gravitation because, quote, he saw no possibility of a satisfactory mechanical explanation of universal attraction. <laughs> And Kelvin, to reject uh, Maxwell's theory, or at least maintain a vacillating and somewhat negative attitude towards that theory, because no satisfactory mechanical model of the electromagnetic ether had been found. Now, presumably these unfortunate consequences of our humoral imbalances are to be avoided by channeling our realist and instrumentalist impulses uh, in more enlightened ways we've considered. Once she realizes that scientific instruments or scientific theories are also instruments for representing phenomena throughout all of nature and serving as resources for inquiry, clues in the search for good hypotheses. The enlightened instrumentalist will take theoretical proposals and possibilities like the exchange of momentum between particles and the ether every bit as seriously as the enlightened realist will. And she'll be ready to explore and think through their consequences, demands, further implications, every bit as fully and thoroughly as the enlightened realist will. Similarly, once realism is stripped of its pretensions to noumenal truth or reference, and its bogus claim to be explaining the sense of science in any way that's not also open to instrumentalists, the enlightened realist will be every bit as willing to take successful theoretical proposals seriously and fully explore their consequences and further implications as candidate theoretical descriptions of the world itself even when she sees no possibility of squaring those proposals with what she thinks she already knows. She will, for example, be willing to embrace and explore Newtonian gravitation, even in the absence of a realistic possibility of providing a mechanical explanation for gravitational force itself. And she'll be willing to press forward and see what more we can do with Maxwell's equations, even in the absence of any mechanical model of the ether whose perturbations they supposedly govern. So there's no difference between enlightened realists and instrumentalists uh, that makes a difference, because after their enlightenment, each will pursue her further scientific investigation 
of nature in precisely the same way. I think that that is why Stein repeatedly stresses the, that the point he's making need not be seen as one that's concerned with realism, debate, or metaphysics, he says, at all, but can be framed equally well in methodological terms, that is, as a point about how scientists should proceed in their investigations. Most importantly, I think, he suggests, I agree wholeheartedly with Boyd that we have learned, that is to say, scientists have indeed learned in their practice and in our philosophical reflections on science, we should by now have learned explicitly, that successful scientific theories are to be taken very seriously as clues to the deeper understanding of phenomena, i.e. clues in the search for better and more fundamental theories. <coughs> it seems to be that enlightened realists and instrumentalists will both embrace a distinctive sort of methodological omnivory. Notice that in every case of imbalanced humors, we find a scientist not taking something seriously enough, and this, is, this seriousness is the language that Howard uses in the paper, Punk raised simple-minded instrumentalism left him, about the ether, left him unwilling to take the idea that particles exchange momentum with it seriously enough to really explore it, right? And consider it. Uh, it might seem that Huygens and Calvin are instead taking what they think they already know about nature too seriously. But in the end, the result is the same. Insisting on the need for consistency with what they, all, they think they already know leads Huygens and Calvin, respectively, to not take Newtonian mechanics and Maxwellian electrodynamics seriously enough to embrace them, work with them, and find out what more we can do with them, even without any clear understanding of how they even could describe nature itself. In both cases, simplistic forms of realism and instrumentalism put up barriers to what we are willing or able to take seriously, and those barriers are removed by enlightening both our realism and instrumentalism into more sophisticated forms that ultimately recommend precisely the same program of methodological omnivory. We are to take seriously every theoretical possibility that actually helps to push our inquiry forward, illuminating unrecognized relationships between the objects of our inquiry, suggesting fruitful new questions for us to investigate, and so on. We should do so because this is one of the ways we can and do make effective use of scientific theories cognitive tools or instruments, as Poincaré failed to fully appreciate. And we should do so even if they seem inconsistent with what we think we already know, as why Vincent Kelvin couldn't get past. Maxwell's balanced humors, we're told, uh, oh sorry, this, that's not a quote, Maxwell, Maxwell's balanced humors seem most clearly revealed in the methodological counsel that he offers us. So this is, it's not quoting Maxwell in the paper. We must bear in mind that the scientific or science-producing value of the efforts made to answer these old standing questions is not to be measured by the prospect they afford us of ultimately obtaining a solution, but by their effect in stimulating men to a thorough investigation of nature. <coughs> Here we see, I think, how and why this dialectical tension, as it may be called, between a realist and instrumentalist attitude existing together <laughs> without contradiction seems to him characteristic of the deepest scientists. So, notice, enlightening the realist and the instrumentalist might not remove every difference between them. The realist might persist in sporadically shouting, really, at her interlocutors, <laughs> for example. Uh, while the instrumentalist might persist in, uh, or might retain the tendency to smugly and irritatingly reassure her audience uh, that, of course, she doesn't actually believe the scientific theories that they're seeking to extend or using as a source of clues in the search for even better theories. But it will remove every difference that actually makes a difference to how one would go about conducting a scientific investigation of some otherwise inaccessible part of the natural world. And beca it's because enlightened realism and enlightened instrumentalism both recommend this kind of methodological omnivory, I think, that there's no difference that makes a difference between them. Now, uh, I want to disagree with this conclusion. I have to admit, I didn't get the memo no. on <laughs> which we weren't doing that. Disagreeing, <laughs> disagreeing with Howard. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, with some trepidation. Uh, I, I'm going to argue that at least one important difference uh, between even enlightened forms of realism and instrumentalism remains. And moreover, that this difference actually makes a difference to how we go about conducting our scientific investigation of nature. 
So the difference that I think remains is actually one that I've elsewhere suggested is the most important or fundamental difference between scientific realists and at least those who are motivated to resist realism by evidence gathered from the historical record. If that's your motivation, right, this is the most uh, fundamental difference. The difference is in their respective conceptions of the future course of scientific inquiry itself. After all, the classical scientific realist believes that contemporary scientific theories have at least the fundamentals sorted out more or less correctly, and that our remaining errors and omissions are largely matters of detail, and that at least the most central claims <clears throat> of contemporary scientific theories will be preserved, ratified, as inquiry continues. <laughs> and more recently popular forms of so-called selective scientific realism, they simply restrict the scope of that expectation to some particular identifiable parts or aspects or elements or features of contemporary scientific theories. Uh, whether those are held to be the theories claims about the structure of nature, their working posits, the core causal descriptions of their reference, or something else altogether. In contrast to both kinds of realists here, the historically motivated instrumentalist expects the future of science to continue to be characterized by theoretical upheavals, transformations, and revolutions, every bit as profound and fundamental as those which have so frequently occurred in its past. And she thinks that we're not in a position to reliably specify or identify just which parts, features, aspects, or elements of our own theories will survive such transformations. She thinks that our own successors will ultimately come to see us much as we see the scientists of our own past. That is, as having grasped what are by later theoretical lights many central and important truths about the world, but as also holding plenty of beliefs about nature that are by those same lights quite profoundly misleading, misguided, mistaken in emphasis, or just plain false. She thinks further fundamental theoretical revolutions are still to come, that are every bit as profound as that which separated Einstein's mechanics from Newton's, Newton's from Descartes, and Descartes from Aristotle's. She doubts that even the best presently available conceptual tools she has for thinking about nature will retain that status as further inquiry proceeds. And she doesn't think we can reliably specify in advance just which parts or elements of those theories we should expect to find preserved in their successors. In a slogan, uh, we might say that instrumentalists expect the future of science to look very much like its past, while realists instead inspect the future of even a vigorously and creatively pursued scientific enterprise to look very much like its present, or at least very much like its present in one or more particular identifiable respects. So that's the realist at the bottom? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you're listening. I understand a lot hangs on the answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> that is the starting point of classical scientific realism. We got it. Okay. Unfair? Yes. Uh, so. Okay, assuming this proposed difference is genuine, let's ne next ask whether it is somehow vitiated or obviated by sophisticating both realism and instrumentalism in the ways Howard suggests are independently required in any case. I don't see why it should be. After all, both classical realist and the selective realist can perfectly main well maintain their distinctive views of the likely and predictable continuities between contemporary scientific theories and those of the near and distant future, even while giving up any pretensions to transcendental or noumenal varieties of truth and reference. Similarly, a realist of either sort can give up their claim to be explaining the success of our best scientific theories in some uniquely realist way without changing her picture of what the future of science will look like. For her part, the instrumentalist can enthusiastically embrace not only the ambition or even responsibility, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to ultimately expand the scope of our theories to represent all the phenomena of nature, but also recognize the role played by those theories in providing resources for inquiry and clues for and search for better and more fundamental theories. But throughout this 
process of enlightenment, she can perfectly well retain the expectation that the outcome of this further investigation will include regular theoretical revolutions, transformations, uh, and upheavals every bit as profound and unpredictable as those we find scattered liberally throughout its history. It seems then that sophisticating realism and instrumentalism into enlightened, Stein-approved forms will not remove or even mitigate what I've suggested is the most fundamental difference between scientific realists and at least those instrumentalists who are motivated by the historical ground. Uh, of course, there's no trouble for Stein here unless this is also a difference that makes a difference to how we prosecute or conduct our further scientific inquiry. Perhaps these contrasting expectations simply sit idly by as we take existing successful scientific theories as a conceptual foundation and best source of clues from which we try to make further progress. In fact, I think the difference that remains between even enlightened forms of realism and instrumentalism does make an important difference to how we investigate nature itself. Uh, to illustrate why, I want to very briefly sketch an argument that I've given elsewhere. And I guess I'll say in advance, uh, the nice thing is it doesn't matter if you're convinced by this argument or not. Uh, uh, given the, per the uses I'm going to make of it. Right? But the, uh, the argument I've given elsewhere is to the effect that although scientific communities have undoubtedly improved throughout the history of the scientific enterprise in their ability to test and evaluate and apply theoretical conceptions of various parts of the natural world, there are substantial reasons for thinking that they've become worse over that same history and their capacity for generating, exploring, or developing new theoretical possibilities that violate or challenge the claims of existing theories. The general idea behind this argument is that those historical transformations of the scientific enterprise that historians of science themselves recognize as most foundational and most significant <clears throat> were all ones in which the incentives and ultimately even the freedom of scientists to propose and develop theoretical proposals departing from, from theoretical uh, from existing theoretical orthodoxy in fundamental ways, right, that those incentives and freedom have been reduced at each of these transitions. Uh, for example, prior to the professionalization of science in Europe and the United States over the middle decades of the 19th century, science was an activity of gentlemanly specialists supported by their own wealth, or royal or aristocratic patronage, or other independent means, and scientists were therefore largely free to conduct their research in whatever way and on whatever subjects they liked. Um, With, but, 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 can I who was the guy who left? Uh, the other slide? Yeah, that's, that's Martin Rubik. Okay. Uh, that's Steve Shapin. And we don't have time for any of these slides. Professionalization. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, uh, um, What's the music? I'm sorry? What's the music? What was the You're hearing something I'm not hearing. <laughs> no. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> See, we never fully appreciate all of the implications. Um, okay, so look, where gentlemen, gentlemanly specialists have been largely free to conduct their research in whatever way and on whatever subjects they liked, professional scientists instead came to depend for their livelihoods on the estimation of the achievements and promise of their scientific research by other members of the community of scientific professionals, and therefore quite literally could not afford to be cavalier about the collective estimation of the interest, promise, or significance of their own research by their professional colleagues. In fact, Restricting the sorts of research questions regarded as appropriate to the discipline, the sorts of activities undertaken in trying to answer them, and the sorts of answers and theoretical proposals that were regarded as plausible or even genuinely scientific in the first place, these were all among the most important ways in which groups of scientific practitioners sought to mark themselves off as professionals and distinguish themselves from those they dismissed as mere amateurs and dilettantes. In this way, scientific communities became more homogeneous in their thinking in their assumptions, in the motives, and even in their dimension, the dimensions of their creative freedom. Professional scientists were substantially less free than their gentlemanly predecessors to simply satisfy their own curiosities on their own terms, to ride idiosyncratic hobby horses, 
to grind ideological axes, or otherwise pursue lines of research or theoretical suggestions that their colleagues might regard as fundamentally misconceived, unpromising, or uninteresting. The resulting theoretical conservatism was further entrenched following World War II, uh, sorry, following World War II, uh, <laughs> by establishing what is essentially the contemporary apparatus of peer-reviewed grant proposals and competitive funding for research in academic science by a small number of centralized agencies of the state. This apparatus ensures that contemporary scientists are only free to pursue particular lines of experimental investigation and theoretical development if they can first convince a panel of peers broadly steeped in existing theoretical orthodoxy that doing so is likely to bear substantial fruit. That, in turn, ensures that successful proposals do not stray too far from conventional wisdom in the field concerning what are promising approaches, reasonable theoretical assumptions, and tractable questions. Luis Alvarez once described this peer review system as the greatest disaster visited upon the scientific community in this century, noting that no group of peers would have approved my building the 72-inch bubble chamber. There's at least some experimental evidence uh, supporting this view of the peer review process as inherently conservative. Uh, and it's, this has been an increasing concern of science policy folks for the last while. Uh, and it's routine to find profound concerns about such excessive or increasing intellectual and theoretical conservatism expressed not only by scientists and writers of science policy, but, I will tell you but not let you read, uh, those same concerns are also expressed by the very administrators who direct and supervise the granting agencies that exhibit it. Indeed, in recent years, uh, the NSF and other granting agencies have responded by taking affirmative steps, not necessarily effective steps, but affirmative steps, uh, to foster more of what they call transformative research, dedicated to revolutionizing entire disciplines, creating entirely new fields, or disrupting accepted theories and perspectives. Okay, let's not get out of hand. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Kuhn argued long ago, maybe this isn't so different, right? Kuhn argued long ago that most science is normal science, seeking to make conservative incremental progress along the lines suggested by existing theoretical orthodoxy. But that means it's worth noting that the contemporary apparatus of peer-reviewed grant proposals and competitive funding for research in academic science by a small number of centralized agencies of the state has made it the case for the first time in history that peer judgments of plausibility and promise determine not only the professional standing, status, and remuneration of scientists who've actually achieved particular results or developed particular theoretical proposals, but also the lines of research and theoretical development that will be supported and therefore even can be pursued in the first place. That's new with the system. Uh, so, uh, moreover, Kuhn also famously suggested that the flexibility and freedom of younger scholars, and those new to a given scientific field, were the most crucial ingredients in the possibility of fundamental or revolutionary change in our scientific beliefs. And that very flexibility and freedom is further threatened by the rise and growth of so-called big science, which is to say the increasing amalgamation of scientific activity into ever larger and more complex research projects involving the increasingly widely distributed efforts of ever larger groups of scientists and institutions. Most importantly, I think, uh, this <coughs> shift has established and entrenched a much stricter kind of hierarchical organization in the pursuit of scientific work and scientific careers in which younger scholars and those new to a scientific field now typically spend many years working as graduate students and postdocs under the supervision of and advancing the existing research programs of more established researchers before starting research programs of their own. As the National Research Council reports, right, this is not just speculation, uh, right, the median age at which a PhD researcher first becomes a principal investigator on her very own NIH grant has been steadily rising uh, from it's actually about age uh, 36 in 1980 to age 42 in 2002. It's a lot of change very fast. 
now what they they conclude, right? That they seem to share Kuhn's broad view of the danger here, right? Academic biomedical researchers are therefore spending long periods of time at the beginning of their careers, unable to set their own research directions or establish their independence. Moreover, there's a serious concern that new investigators are being driven to pursue more conservative research projects instead of the high-risk, high-reward research that can significantly advance science. The special creativity that younger scientists may bring to their work is also lost as these investigators are forced to focus on others' research. For all but the most senior scientists, both learning and practicing science today is a matter of working in close collaboration with a more senior advisor or mentor to find, to propose, and conduct research projects with the best chances of being accepted and funded by groups of established researchers in the field. Norbert Wiener once condemned what he called this latter-day feudal system of the intellect, in which a younger scientist would simply be a cog in a modern scientific factory, doing what I was told, accepting the problems given me by my superiors, and holding my brain only in commendum as a medieval vassal held his feet. <laughs> uh, I won't resist the temptation to keep going on it, Wiener. Um, right. He added, from the bottom of my heart, I pity the present generation of scientists, many of whom, whether they wish it or not, are doomed by the spirit of the age to be intellectual lackeys and clock punchers. <laughs> In another work, he lamented the degradation of the scientist as an independent worker and thinker to that of morally irresponsible stooge in a science factory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Never get tired of reading. <laughs> um, although less bombastic, but perhaps equally revealing, is Einstein's report to an American journalist in 1954. If I were a young man again and had to decide how to make a living, I would not try to become a scientist or scholar or teacher. I would rather choose to be a plumber or peddler in the hope of finding that modest degree of independence still available. <laughs> <laughs> You can't always trust what Einstein says, but... So. <laughs> All right, now, for present purposes... We're doing this time. We're doing okay. For present purposes, it doesn't matter whether or not the history of the scientific enterprise is actually one of increasing theoretical conservatism or not. And that's good, because I really haven't given you any serious systematic evidence that it is. Uh, what matters is that even enlightened realists and instrumentalists will respond very differently to this possibility or this worry, or this threat, and to concerns about theoretical conservatism in science more generally. Uh, after all, even enlightened realists of the sort I described earlier think that at least the best or most successful contemporary theories have things worked out at least roughly right, that our remaining errors are largely matters of detail, and that further theoretical change will consist in modest incremental improvements to presently accepted theories. Or, more modestly, our selective realist friends think that we're at least in a position to identify those parts, aspects, or features of our best scientific theories, which have got things roughly right and which will persist indefinitely into the future as the group proceeds. She's confident that the theories or the relevant parts of theories embraced by future scientific communities will seem both to us and to members of those communities simply to be corrected, expanded, and more sophisticated versions of the ones that we ourselves have accepted. With respect to those theories, or those elements and features of our theories, she really does not see any need for revolutionizing entire disciplines, for creating entirely new fields, or disrupting accepted theories and perspectives. <clears throat> the realist should be happy for review boards to rule out consideration of lines of research or theoretical proposals that are radically or fundamentally at odds with existing theories or the relevant parts and features, as she thinks it quite unlikely that any such alternative will ultimately come to be accepted. Indeed, the farther from existing theoretical orthodoxy or some privileged part of it a proposal strays, the more confident this realist will be that it's misguided in some fundamental way. Of course, the realist might have instrumental reasons. Oh, sorry, this just says what I just said. Uh, right? Of course, the realist might have instrumental reasons for taking seriously or exploring theoretical possibilities that conflict with what she already thinks she knows. Uh, for example, as Ronald, Ronald Fisher once famously suggested, no 
practical biologist interested in sexual reproduction would be led to work out the detailed consequences experienced by organisms having three or more sexes. Yet what else should he do if he wishes to understand why the sexes are, in fact, always two? Right. But whatever instrumental reasons the realist has for such pursuits, the instrumentalist also has, and an additional one that's ultimately far more important. She believes that even more instrumentally successful scientific theories, radically or fundamentally distinct from contemporary theoretical orthodoxy, are actually out there, waiting to be discovered. The methodological import of this difference becomes salient as soon as we recognize that the resources available for pursuing scientific inquiry are scarce and limited. It might now seem more noteworthy that the Forgetting to, uh, forgetting to have my slides catch up to what I'm saying. I mean, this says what I just said. Uh, the instrumentalist has the realist's instrumental reasons, plus she thinks they're actually out there. Right? We're actually going to go find fundamentally distinct theories that are better <clears throat> or even more successful than the ones we have now. Uh, so it might now seem more noteworthy that the upshot of Stein's discussion was that enlightened realists and enlightened instruments, instrumentalists should both be methodological omnivores, prepared to take any successful theory seriously enough to be willing to embrace it, develop it, and really think through its consequences or implications, as a candidate description of nature itself. If I'm right to think that the difference in the realists' and instrumentalists' expectations about the future of the scientific enterprise survived this process of enlightenment, Realists and instrumentalists are not equally entitled to such methodological omnivory. That is, insofar as the realist takes herself to know which current theories, or parts, aspects, and features of theories, are likely to persist throughout the course of further inquiry, she has good reasons to neglect or ignore theoretical possibilities that contradict them. Okay. Uh, always the right question when reading this paper. Um, and it is natural to wonder if I haven't made things look this way, by, only by not taking seriously enough Stein's efforts to reorient the realism debate itself away from its traditional obsessions with questions of the approximate truth of our best scientific theories and whether central terms in those theories refer to anything. Right? This way of framing the issue has invidious consequences we just heard about right, from uh, in, in, in Wayne's talk. Right? Uh, and Stein thinks we can see these invidious consequences uh, from the fact that both realists and their instrumentalist opponents see atoms and ether as having had diametrically opposed fortunes. There are atoms, ether, and atom refers. If there isn't any ether, ether doesn't refer. When in fact, our own physical, like this is just what you just read from Wayne, right? That's the real situation, okay? our, uh, our own physics tells us nothing has all the properties posited by 19th century physicists for either one, but on the other hand, in both instances, rather important uh, parts of 19th century, 19th century theories are correct. The only real difference between them is the superficial fact that our textbooks still use the word atom, but not the word ether. He concludes, this is him throwing up his hands, uh, he concludes, the two cases, that of the ether and that of atoms, are in my view so similar that the radical distinction made between them by referential realists confirms in me the antecedent suspicion that this concern for reference, and associated with it another Quinean motif, the concern for what is called the ontology of theories, is a distraction from what really matters. Fortunately, he goes on immediately to tell us what really does matter. That is, what kind of knowledge we ultimately do get from our scientific investigation of the natural world. Uh, and I am going to apologize for quoting this nearly in full. On a certain very deep question, so, so reference and approximate truth and all that stuff, no, that's not the right way to think about it. How should we think about what it is we learn? On a certain very deep question, Aristotle was entirely wrong, and Plato, at least on one reading, the one I prefer, remarkably right. Namely, our science comes closest to comprehending the real, not in its account of substances and their kinds, but in its account of the forms which phenomena imitate. For forms, read theoretical structures. For imitate, are represented by. In mathematics itself, 
concerned for forms without regard to phenomena, the deepest general discovery of the whole modern epoch is that deeper understanding of forms or structures of mathematics characteristically consists in their being seen in unexpected relations to one another, or to newly discovered structures, which play a unifying or generalizing or expanding role in our understanding of the more familiar ones. The forms participate in one another. And in the development of physics in the same period, an analogous, in some ways even more astonishing discovery has emerged. More astonishing, not least because of the circumstance I am here concerned to emphasize, that in this structural deepening, what tends to persist, to remain, as it were, quasi-invariant through the transformation of theories, is on the whole, and especially in what we think of as the deepest or most revolutionary transformations, not the features most conspicuous in referential semantics, the substances or entities and their own basic properties or relations, but the more abstract mathematical forms. Here, Stein seems to say that what we actually learn from our scientific investigation of nature uh, is how platonic forms are imitated by phenomena and participate in one another, or less colorfully, how theoretical structures represent phenomena and relate to one another, sometimes in unexpected or surprising ways. I'm not going to pretend to fully understand this description of the character of the knowledge of the natural world that we uh, get from, from science, though it actually sounds a little bit like some formulations of John Worrell's structural realism. For present purposes, what matters most is that Stein picks out this distinctive knowledge of the forms or structures, their participation in one another, their imitation by phenomena, as something that the historical record shows to be quasi-invariant through the transformation of theories. He singles out the principles of Lagrangian dynamics, for example, as that form which has survived these radical transformations of physics and enthusiastically echoes Whitehead's declaration with the beauty and almost divine simplicity of these equations, such that these formulae are worthy to rank with those mysterious symbols which in ancient times were held directly to indicate the supreme reason <coughs> at the base of all things. He's similarly confident when scolding Poincaré in his faint-hearted instrumentalism, uh, noting that it is, now, it is established now beyond a doubt that ordinary bodies do exchange momentum with the ether, i.e. with the electromagnetic field, and even that this field has to be regarded as the seat of a distribution of mass and is participating in gravitational interactions. But it seems to me you can't have it both ways. No matter how colorfully or metaphorically we characterize our scientific knowledge, at the end of the day, we either know things about the natural world that we justifiably expect to be preserved and ratified throughout the course of future inquiry, or we do not. If we do have such knowledge, even if it's only structural or relational in character, then it seems that we should not be methodological omnivores of the sort that Stein advocates. We should take what we think we already know seriously, and that should influence where we are and are not willing to invest time, money, and other scarce resources available for scientific inquiry. And we should, should be systematically skeptical, if we think we do have such knowledge, we should be systematically skeptical about investing those scarce resources in finding, developing, and or testing theoretical alternatives that contradict or violate or ignore whatever it is we think we've already learned. On this view, it seems like the mistake made by Huggins and Kelvin was not being too confident in what they thought they already knew. After all, Stein seems to recommend similar conf confidence regarding the principles of Lagrangian dy dynamics what we think about how the forms imitate phenomena and participate in one another more general. Instead, Huygens and Kelvin got unlucky. What they thought they knew about the world turned out to be false. Now, of course, by Stein's lights, Huygens and Kelvin may also have erred in a further important way, because what they thought they knew about the world, uh, 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 what, they thought, <clears throat> what they thought they knew came from considerations that were in some way external to the relevant science itself. So in practice, I think this within science from without uh, division is going to be uh, hard to, to draw when it really counts. But however that may stand, in any case, I think we can now see why convicting their humors of this further crime uh, isn't going to undermine the difference that I've been suggesting remains. The difference between the realist and instrumentalist is whether and to what extent each is prepared to use consistency with existing theoretical orthodoxy to limit and constrain 
our further exploration of nature. And that difference remains, whether we've learned what we think we know from physics or anywhere else. Of course, uh, Howard might be instead tempted to jettison his somewhat cryptic remarks about what we've learned from history uh, and concede that we should expect even the knowledge we get from within physics of how phenomena imitate the forms and participate in one another to be overturned by further scientific developments. This is what it seems it would take to turn Stein's enlightened realists into honest methodological omnivores. But it seems like this would also be to abandon any claim to represent a kind of irenic middle ground between realism and instrumentalism. If all that our realist humors contribute at the end of the day is the confidence that when we look back at earlier scientific theories, we, are, we will inevitably be able to marvel at some pattern of foundational structural continuities and relationships between them and their successors, but we can't say anything in advance about what those continuities will be in any particular case, we seem to have given up even the most minimal form of the realist's commitment. That is, that contemporary scientific theories, or at least some parts or aspects of those theories, give us actual knowledge of the world that we can justifiably take to the bank, trust, and count on, even as further inquiry proceeds. If we give that up, I suggest, then Howard does not argue that there's no difference that makes a difference between enlightened realism and enlightened instrumentalism, but instead simply that all sensible people should be enlightened instrumentalists and methodological omnivores of the sort that he so engagingly described.